Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us. Since the onset of the financial crisis, all eyes have been on central bankers and their attempts through creative monetary policy to try to stimulate growth. In plain speak, that means doing what they can to drive interest rates down and growth rates up. We see 2017 as a transition year led by the United States, whereby the baton, if you will, is being passed from monetary stimulus to fiscal stimulus to help drive growth, and thus the title of our outlook, Passing the Baton. And growth has been the problem here and abroad. Bottom line, global growth has been cut in half since the Great Recession. Specifically, the global GDP growth rate prior to the recession had been averaging 3.9% per year. Since then, it's been roughly half that at 2.3. There are certainly economic consequences associated with subpar growth, but also the anemic growth has brought about the nationalism and populism across much of the developed world with frustration with the status quo. It's brought about the Brexit vote in the UK, the Italian referendum, and of course the election in the US. And it's not as if central bankers have failed. They haven't. They've done a heroic job of very creative, unprecedented sort of measures. This whole alphabet soup of TARP and TELP and QE1 and QE2 and Operation Twist. This twister analogy here where we have depicted Mario Draghi and Janet Yellen, the central bankers being all twisted up in knots. It's not that they're twisted up in knots, but it's the fact that they've made very creative moves and they've, they've won. We've averted financial disaster and it's run its course primarily in the United States. We think Europe will follow, maybe not this year, but bottom line, monetary policy has largely done its work here in the U.S. and the baton is being passed, if you will, to fiscal stimulus. And what does that mean? Very simple, two things. Fiscal stimulus is spending more and taxing less. And with the election cycle, we heard a lot about infrastructure spending. We've heard a lot about tax reform, both corporate and individual. There's high expectations that both of those will provide an impetus to growth. We think that there will be some constructive uh, growth elements to increase spending and diminish taxes, but we think expectations are a little bit ahead of themselves. After all, we think there's going to be some restraint as far as how much uh, deficit spending will actually be passed. Bottom line, we think uh, consensus is reflecting kind of fiscal stimulus on the order of what we're showing here. In reality, it's probably going to be more like that. So directionally positive, yes, but probably not a huge game changer as far as jump-starting the economy to another growth plane. However, the one thing that has changed and is a game changer is confidence. Something changed dramatically with the election, whether it's CEO confidence, consumer confidence, small business confidence. Since the election, something's changed because they've all spiked. Consumer confidence, in fact, is at a 15-year high. And the bottom line is that people are believing that we're going to have a, a, a landscape that is much more business friendly, if you will, with respect to regulation, whereby it is less costly and less cumbersome. The, the whole animal spirits, if you will, it has been heightened where people are more confident, they're more willing to take risk, and with higher confidence comes stronger economic growth and stronger and higher interest rates. Interest rates to that end have already moved. They move quite a bit. In fact, if you look at the yield on the 10-year, having troughed here at 1.3% yield in the summer, almost doubled right after the election. It's retraced a little bit. We believe that, as the headline says, rates are going to go up, but not enough to derail the economy, the stock market, or the bond market. But, but the fact is, stronger economic growth here in America, coupled with a Fed that's tightening rates, is going to put upward pressure on rates. Offsetting that will be still a low global rate complex, as other central bankers haven't yet followed the Fed's move to start tightening. So that will serve to put a bit of a lid on rates. Bottom line, we see a trading range between two and a quarter and three and a quarter on the yield on the on the ten-year Treasury. If we had to guess right now, we would assume we'd end the year between two and three quarters and three. Bottom line, we're maintaining our neutral duration, letting it shorten as things roll off and mature rather than shortening from these levels. We still overweight corporates, and we think the return will be positive for bonds. It will be modest, but you earn your coupon minus a little bit, and bonds are in the portfolio, again, as a risk reducer. Now, though rates are going up, and we say not enough to matter, that applies to the economy and stocks because we don't think rates are going to rise enough to derail the stock market either. At this point, for the market to go higher, it's going to be all about earnings. And earnings have been a disappointment here for the last three years. What we've highlighted here is in light shading 
the expectations for earnings on the S&P at the beginning of the year and then what actually happened in 2014, 15, and 16. And notice two things. First of all, we've been stuck, sort of flatlined here. Now, granted, we don't have fourth quarter earnings in, but based on the expectations, we're still going to be stuck around $116, $117 on S&P earnings, despite expectations for something much higher. Over the last three years, it's been the same old culprits for the shortfall. Number one, strong dollar. Two, soft demand abroad, and three, in 2014 and 15, plunging energy prices. In 2017, as we enter, expectations call for $132. Again, Wall Street historically is an over-optimistic lot. Uh, we think $132 isn't attainable, but we do believe this year we will see, with a firming economy and increased confidence, we think we will see single-digit sort of earnings growth. And that's necessary because we've been bailed out here in recent years. The market's gone up, not because of earnings, but because people have paid more and more for a dollar of earnings. In other words, P.E. multiples have gone up. And to that point, we're reusing a chart we've used a couple times in recent years to make a, a simple point here as to our enthusiasm for stocks. The simple point is this, the more you pay for stocks, the less the expected return. And what this chart shows is we've plotted the P.E. multiple at the beginning of the year and what the average return has been following that. And the point is this, anytime stocks have traded at 10 times earnings or less, the average return a year forward has been about 13 times and so on down here when the market's traded between 14 and 18 times at the beginning of the year, the return's only been eight. When the P.E. multiple's been 18 times or greater, the return's only been about three and a half. Makes sense intuitively. We're buying the same basket of 500 stocks. The more you pay for it, the less the return. Now, the first time we used this chart was 2014. We're trading at 12 times earnings. The market in 2014 returned 13 percent, very sort of textbook. 2015, we were trading 16 times. The market only went up a percent and a half, and earnings went nowhere. 2016, we're still in the same spot. Market surprise to the upside, returned about 12%. So we've averaged 7% over the last two years. The other thing I would point out is all through the cycle here since the recession, we've been overweight U.S. stocks. In 2015, at the end of the year, we took money off the table, cut our overweight in half based not on the fact that we were bearish on stocks, but the expected return was diminished relative to the risk we were assuming. Same thing at the end of 2016 in the fourth quarter. We took our overweight to neutral, in other words, to the target weight for client portfolios. Again, not because we were bearish, but because the expected return wasn't as compelling for the risk we were taking. As we enter 2017, here we are. We're trading at 18 times earnings. So we have modest expected return in this environment. Now, we expect, as we said two charts back, earnings to grow, probably a mid-single digit sort of thing. That's our base case. We also believe that more so than any point in the last five or six years, we think volatility is going to be heightened. There's a greater sort of tail risk, if you will, for a market that's either down 15 or so or up 15 percent. As far as the error of the estimate, though, we think it's more towards the upside because of the stronger economic growth, the increasing confidence, and something that we saw at the end of the year that's been rare in, in this cycle, and that is money actually flowing into equities. They've been flowing out of equities for most of this bull market, and we believe that we could see a sort of blow-off year where money continues to flow into equities, driving prices higher despite higher interest rates. We think we could get a higher stock market. So the error of the estimate there is to the upside in our view as we enter 2017. So to wrap up, modestly stronger economic growth in GDP terms, that's probably two and a quarter to two and a half percent. Stronger growth means higher interest rates, but not high enough to derail either the bond market, stock market, or the economy at large. We expect modest returns from equities with the error of the estimate to the upside. The themes that we employed at the end of last year still very much are enforced within our domestic portfolio, namely overweight energy, though that was a great trade last year with energy prices up 50 percent. We still think there's more to go, as well as overweight health care and underweight the very expensive staple sectors. We think those three themes will add value over and above the index return. And finally, with respect to asset allocation, uh, we say risk and reward are balanced. Uh, never before in the last decade have we entered the year with the major asset classes on target, meaning neutral or the midpoint of clients' asset allocation range. Uh, we say that because the risk and reward are, are very much offsetting. There isn't one asset class that seems extraordinarily compelling relative to the risk and reward. 
On one hand, international equities are cheap. They've underperformed for 10 years, not to mention last year. On the other hand, political risks are very much heightened. Uh, domestically, we just talked about how we expect a positive return, but yet they're not cheap. Same thing is true for real estate. We like the cash flow, but that's not an undiscovered asset class. And bonds, though they have a very modest return and interest rates are rising, uh, they provide a great hedge should the equity market sell off, bonds would certainly appreciate. So we find ourselves at the target allocation, middle of the road, if you will, with the expectation that asset prices will go up this year and we'll have a chance to further reduce risk from a higher level as the year progresses. We shall see. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Have a great winter, and we look forward to catching up with you in the spring.